as you guys can tell from the video, we're starting a new series, uh, Faithfulness in Fearful Times. And I think we can all admit that, uh, especially if you guys are on social media a lot and if you've been watching the news, uh, we do live in some uh, very anxious times. Uh, one quick note, uh, I don't know if you guys know, but they train social media people and they, like news agencies, they've discovered that uh, they get more clicks and they get more coverage or viewership uh, when they ramp up the fear. Isn't that interesting? Right? So um, as, as kind of like mobilization, right, you know, to kind of like prop up your news site or, you know, your social media, um, you know, the best way to get a lot of viewership is to actually increase the fear. So, um, yeah, so, you know, what we wanted to do as a church today is to talk about, you know, as the people of God, what, what does faithfulness look like in times where anxiety seems to be heightened and, and fear seems to abound? Because, um, you know, the most oft-repeated command in Scripture is, do not be afraid, which implies that we do live in very fearful times. So what does the Bible have to say to that? Uh, what does God's Word have to say to that so that in the midst of fearful times, surrounded by fearful people making very poor decisions, that we would actually be different, that we would be courageous and be faithful and make right decisions so that the consequences of our lives would actually turn out a lot better. So what we're going to do for the next several weeks is study characters in the Bible. Today we're going to be looking at Hagar and Sarai. Uh, next week we're going to be looking at Moses uh, all the way down. Uh, some characters that, in the midst of fear, they made good decisions. Some characters, in the midst of fear, they made very poor decisions. And in the midst of all that, uh, the consequences of what happens when we do make these type of decisions, but overarching all of that, the faithfulness of God over his people, especially in fearful times. So um, I'm excited for this, and I hope that you could join with us and that through this, that our faith would really increase, okay? Uh, as is our tradition, we're going to be reciting our Southland Proclamation together. So if you guys, uh, have, you know, uh, believe this, let's recite this together uh, as fellow believers in Christ, okay? This is the Word of God. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can. I am a precious child of God, forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, I desire to be filled and led by the Holy Spirit day by day so that the promise of God may be fulfilled in and through my life. Amen. So today we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 16. So if you guys have your Bibles, uh, turn with me there. I'm going to be reading Genesis chapter 16 from the uh, NASB version. So here's the reading of God's holy word. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, Now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. Now Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan. Abram's wife Sarai took Hagar, the Egyptian, her maid, and gave her to her husband Abram as his wife. He went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her sight. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done me be upon you. I gave my maid into your arms, but when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her sight. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your maid is in your power. Do to her what is good in your sight. So Sarai treated her harshly, and she fled from her presence. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to sure. All right. It's reading of God's word. So here's a little context. So we're at Genesis chapter 16 now, and as we look at this uh, chapter, we see that, um, you know, a chapter back, Abraham, uh, God promised Abraham that he's going to have a child. And then 10 years passes, and scripture teaches us that Sarai is now 75 years old, which probably means that she is past the age of childbearing. Um, she is barren. She probably hit menopause. And she's come to the conclusion that physically, that she is not 
able to have children anymore. Now, um, you know, uh, what I've learned is barrenness is actually a great stress upon a person. One uh, medical psychologist basically said that barrenness, the stress of barrenness is actually equated to someone uh, receiving the diagnosis that they got cancer. So the stress of barrenness is actually equated to the stress of cancer. So this is where Sarai is at right now. Sarai has been waiting for the birth of a child, and she's been waiting eagerly. Uh, she's been waiting with all her heart. Ten years passes. The Lord's promise seems to be slow. God doesn't seem to deliver. She comes to the conclusion that I can't have a baby anymore, and this is where Scripture leaves us. Now, what does Sarai do? What is her response to all this? What is her response to a very difficult circumstance that she finds herself in? Right? Uh, like a lot of us, Sarai actually blames God. She actually blames God. Look, look at what the text says here in verse 1. It says, now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, so that's the context. Waiting 10 years, she comes to the conclusion, I can't have children anymore. So Sarai said to Abram, now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. In this very difficult time, she actually loses faith. She loses hold of what God has promised. Right? Now, why is that? Why does Sarai lose faith? Why is it that at times in our lives that we lose faith? You see, uh, you see how her name is Sarai? Later on, God changes her name to Sarah. You see how Abram's name right now is Abram? Later on, God changes his name to Abraham. Now, the classic definition is it, God is saying you're going to be the father of many nations. But when you look at the trajectory of Scripture, the name actually changes when their faith begins to mature and grow. Paul, in the book of Romans, talks about how uh, in the midst of an incredibly impossible situation that Abram, Abraham and Sarah found themselves in, they actually hoped in the midst of hopelessness, right? So what do we learn here? Well, you know, the reason why Sarah, Sarai blames God is because uh, she loses faith, and she is still on the path of the development and the growth of her faith. Now, why does she have such weak faith? What is actually a criteria for weak faith, right? How do we know, right? Is you're sitting here today, how do you know that you have a strong faith versus a weak faith, right? Um, you know what the Bible actually says the difference between a weak faith and a strong faith is? It's not how you respond to a circumstance. The difference is, is this. When you find yourself in a very difficult circumstance, you make a judgment before you allow Jesus to speak into that circumstance. If you make a judgment before you allow Jesus to speak into that circumstance, that means you are more like Sarai. But if you allow the Word of God to speak into the circumstances of your life, right, before you make a judgment, that means your faith has actually matured. That's the difference. You know, um, the disciples of Jesus actually went through this. You know, there was a time where Jesus is actually sleeping on a boat. Storm comes. And as the storm comes, uh, you know, the disciples freak out and they make a judgment. They go to Jesus and they say, Jesus, how come you don't care about us? We're going to die, right? Do you not love us? And then after they made that judgment, Jesus speaks. He uh, sushes the storm. He stills it. Right? And then he lets them know, this is what I think about the circumstance, this is what I think about the situation. And then he looks at the disciples and he says, O oh, ye of little faith. Why did they have little faith? The reason why they had little faith was in the midst of the storm that they were going through, they made a judgment without allowing Jesus to speak into it. This was Sarai's problem. Right? Rather than going to God, in this entire chapter, there is not a moment where Sarai prays to God. There's moments where she's thinking. There's moments where she's talking to Abram. There's moments when she's uh, mistreating Hagar. There's moments where, you know, uh, she's making decisions. 
But not a single time in this entire chapter as she's going through a very difficult circumstance is she praying to God, trying to see what God has to say into that situation. So uh, my encouragement to you, my encouragement to you is this. One of the greatest temptations in life is to make a judgment of your current situation, to make a judgment of your current circumstance before allowing God's voice to speak into that circumstance. And I say, don't do it. Don't ever make a judgment on what you're going through, uh, what's happening to your life until Jesus has spoken into it. Can I get amen on that? Right? Always go to God. Always go to God and say, Lord, I'm going through a difficult time. Lord, I feel like this is what's going on in my life, and I'm so tempted to make a judgment, but please, Lord, help me not to make a judgment until you have spoken into it, okay? All right, so let's go on. So what does Sarai do? She blames God, and naturally, when you lose faith in God and then you blame God, you create your own plan. Sarai takes matters into her own hands. Look what it says here. Now Sarai had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, please go into my maid. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. So uh, she uses a normal ancient Near East custom for people who are barren. And, you know, she says, hey, this is actually a possible way. So she doesn't necessarily go right out and, like, you know, does something scandalous according to the culture of that day. But she says, hey, this is an option. Not an option that God was leading her in, but she's trying to like, you know, um, like manipulate the plan of God, not fully follow through on the plan of God, right? She says, you know what? We tried God's way. Now we're going to do it my way, right? I was on the God train. Now I'm going to go on my own train, you know? So that's what she does. She takes matters into her own hand. Why? Because she was tired of waiting, she didn't want to wait anymore. She probably looked at God and she said, Lord, 10 years, way too long. Right? I bet she had a lot of faith her first year. Right? I bet she was still going strong in her fifth year. But 10 years, that's a long time. You know, we shouldn't be so quick to judge Sarai because for some of us, we can't even wait an hour, right? right? We shouldn't be like, you know, what's wrong with Sarai? Right? You should wait 11 years before you can judge her, right? You know, but after 10 years, Sarai's like, I can't do this anymore. I'm tired of waiting, which brings up another question. Especially if you're a Christian, you need to get this right. Why does God have us wait so long? You guys ever wondered that before? Why does God make us wait? Right? Why not just give it to us? Especially the things he has promised. Why not just give it to us, right? Why does God make us wait, right? Or how come he doesn't take the struggle away? You know that gift that he promised? Give it to us now. Lord, you said you want to give us the abundant life. Lord, you promised that for all your children. How come you don't give it to us right away? Why is it that for some of us you make us wait? Right? You guys ever wonder why? Because I know for a lot of you here, you're in that season of waiting, right? Aren't you in that season of waiting? And let me tell you this. Most seasons of waiting, it sucks, right? No one's ever like, wow, you know, praise the Lord. You're you're sharing in cell. I'm so blessed that I'm in a season of waiting, right? No. Why does God have us wait so long, right? What's he doing? You know, uh, God called David to be king, King David, right? God looked at David and said, you're going to be king. You know when he became king? 12 years later, right? Why wait so long? And you know that 12 years when, uh, when God told David to the point where David became king? Those 12 years were not great years. He was on the run for his life. He was hiding in a cave, uh, you know, like he thought uh, he, thought he was going to die. Uh, he, he, he felt anxious all the time. Uh, you know, he didn't feel like, you know, life was comfortable, nor was it easy, right? People were hating on him, right? And, and you know, one question that I, that I heard was like, you know, when God promised David to be king here, right, you know, why does God make David wait 12 years when all he had to do was kill Saul, like literally destroy Saul, so that David could be king right away? 
Why? In the, in the, in the promise of God, in, in, in the mysterious sovereignty and the providence of God, why does God make David wait 12 years? Which leads to the question for some of us, like, well, why, why do I feel like I'm in a holding pattern right now? Right? Uh, why is it that, you know, no opportunities are coming? Why, why is it that, you know, I just feel like I'm kind of in this, like, stuck uh, in a rut, dead in life? Uh, why do I feel this way? I, I feel like there's no way out for me, and I'm just kind of like, you know, just, just living life, going day in and day out and day in and day out, and, and it just feels like uh, uh, I feel so lost, right? Which, why does God make us wait? You guys, you guys ever asked that before? Right? You know, um, there was a season in my life where I asked that question, and, and I believe this is kind of how the Lord has answered me. This, this is kind of how, like, you know, God spoke to me, right? And let me kind of explain it like this, okay? Um, do you guys know that the great, uh, you know, um, true happiness, okay, true happiness and true joy, did you know that it's found in relationships, right? Now, that makes sense, right? But um, some people think it's found in education. Some people think it's found in achievements. Some people think it's found in, you know, status or good circumstances. So at the University of Pennsylvania, there was a bunch of happiness psychologists who were studying um, the theory of happiness, and they studied the Western world. And within the Western world, they said that things like education, achievements, wealth, status, and even good circumstances, uh, once you hit that zero level, it doesn't increase happiness. So it can get you out of like unhappiness, but it can't increase happiness. What actually increases happiness, uh, there was a several handful of things, but one of the most important things was what actually increases happiness is the depth and the quality and the intimacy of the relationships that we have with people that we love, right? That's what actually increases happiness. Now, what has that got to do with God making us wait, right? Uh, did you know that deep, intimate relationships, you know how they're formed? Do you, do you know how they're forged? The deepest, most intimate relationships are formed over a period of time, especially in intense trials and hardships, right? That's where the best relationships are formed, right? You guys ever heard the term fair weather friends, right? You know what that is, fair weather friends, right? When the weather gets rough, they're not there anymore, right? Those are friends only in nice weather. Right? One person said those are California friends because it's always nice here. Right? You know, um, so in many ways, right, our relationship with God, some of us, he's a fair weather God. Why? Because every time he tries to deepen his relationship with you, every time he tries to go beyond the acquaintance level, you run away, right? Over a long period of time, in great difficulty and hardships and suffering, right? God wants to draw near to you and tell you he's more than a fair weather friend. He wants to be there with you in the thick and thin. He wants, to, he wants you to experience his love but rather than paying your attention to that, you turn to everything else but that. So you miss out on this incredible opportunity to go deeper into your relationship with God to achieve the greatest happiness of your life. Why? Because you're chasing after different things. Think about it, right? Think about it. You know, God could tell you, right? He could tell you what you want to know, right? He could tell you, right? In fact, he could give you what he wants to give you a lot sooner. He could, right? God, God could do that, right? So God could tell you what you want to know a lot sooner, 
God could give you what you want to receive a lot sooner. So, so, so why does God withhold that, right? Okay, let's talk about the benefit and cost of that. So what's the benefit of that? What's the benefit of, you know, like, God, you know, uh, what's my life supposed to be five years from now, right? And, and what if God said, you know what, let me tell you what your life is supposed to be five years from now. What if he told you? What's the benefit of that? Peace of mind, right? Peace of mind, right? Like, you don't have to worry about it anymore. <laughs> you know God told you, right? But do you know that decision actually has a cost too? Did you know that decision actually has a cost? There's a benefit, but there's also cost, right? Okay, uh, what if God gave you what he wanted to give you right now rather than five years later? What's the benefit of that? You get it a lot sooner, right? That's the benefit. Do you know there's actually a cost to that, right? There's a benefit and a cost. So there's a benefit, you know, God, you know, uh, uh, what am I supposed to be five years from now? L Lord, this dream job that I want, a a am I supposed to have that five years from now? And what if God said, yes, you are supposed to have that. In fact, you want it right now? I'll give it to you right now. Who would thank God right now? You're like, this is a trick question here. This is, pastors do this, right? I mean, doesn't that sound good? I sound like Satan right now, huh? Doesn't that sound good? Hey, doesn't that sound good? Right? God's going to tell you now what you wanted to know, and he'll even give it to you now what you wanted to know. Doesn't that sound good? Who wants it right now? Raise your hand. You better not raise your hand. <laughs> but doesn't that sound good? Sounds good, huh? For that benefit, there's a cost. You know what the cost is? Yeah, you'll get the gift, and you'll also get the knowledge. You know what you're going to lose out on? An intimate relationship with God. You know why? Because you'll stop relying on him. You'll stop depending on him. You'll never know him as faithful in the midst of the hardest times of your life. And you'll never go deeper with him. You know what God wants to do? You know what God wants to do? He wants to give you the gift, and he wants to give you himself. Can I get an amen on that? It's not, I'm just going to give you myself, you don't get the gift. No, Abram and Sarai, they got the child, right? You see that? They got the child. They got Isaac. But what else did they get? Oh, they got to go deeper in love with God. They got to see the faithfulness of God. They saw God in amazing ways, right? They saw God as a great provider. You see, church, brothers and sisters, right? God is not a vending machine. He wants to have the most intimate relationship with you. That's why he makes you wait. Why? Why does God make me wait? Because he wants to give you a double blessing, not just a single. Right? So if you are like, ah, oh, why can't God tell me now? Why can't just God give it to me now? That's probably the voice of the evil one. What God is saying is this. I'm not going to tell you now. I'm not going to give it to you right now because I want to give you both later. Isn't that worth it? Isn't that cool? Right? Let's go on. So, wait upon the Lord. You know, if, if you come to our church, you're going to hear that a lot. Wait upon the Lord. Right? Wait upon the Lord. You know what that means? It doesn't just mean you just wait and do nothing, but you wait in relationship with the Lord. You wait in prayer, you wait in the word, you, you wait in fasting, you wait in worship, you wait in community, you wait with the Lord. So that when you finally receive all that he wants to give you by faith, you not only have the gift, but you have a profound, deeper knowledge of the giver. Amen? Why? Because scripture says the greatest thing in life is knowing God. And that's what I want you to experience. Let's go on.
But Sarai, she doesn't do that. She takes matters into her own hands. The Bible is very uh, honest. And the Bible actually says, here's some bitter fruits. So um, she makes a bad decision. And within the grace of God, there's still negative consequences. So here's consequence number one. Hagar despises Sarai. When she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her sight. Bitter fruit number two, marriage problems. Sarai said, may the wrong done me be upon you. Now she's talking to Abram. I gave my maid into your arms, but when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her sight. May the Lord judge between you and me. So she blames God, she blames Abram. That's, that's kind of a classic expression of a person that has no boundaries, uh, a person uh, that's very self-centered, and a person that feels like they're a victim, like everybody's against them. Um, Sarai mistreats Hagar. Verse 6, Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your maid is in your power. Do to her what is good in your sight. So Sarai treated her harshly, and Hagar fled from her presence. Uh, you know why I say all this is because do you see the bitter fruits of doing it your own way in fearful times? Right? That, that's just, you know, the Bible is very clear on that. It's very bitter fruits. You know, um, yeah, you, uh, you know, the Bible is really realistic, right? You know, you want to do it your way, you'll probably get it, you probably get something, but later on you're going to realize how bitter that fruit is. You know, like, you know, oh, I really want this, I really want this, I'm tired of waiting, I don't want God to give it to me, so I'm going to go get it. You probably get it, right? God's not going to stop you because there's this thing called free will, but then there's bitter circumstances, bitter fruit, right? And we see, that in, we see that clearly here, that human solutions to the problems of life actually creates even more problems. You know, what's funny is it's not just Sarai, but Hagar takes matters into her own hands, <laughs> Right? So she's going through a hard time. Sarai's mistreating her. So, you know, in the midst of Hagar's suffering, she decides on her own, I'm going to run away. And now she's on her way back to Egypt because that's where she's from. And she's running away from her mistress. Why? Because she's in fear. Right? And this is where something really interesting happens. Right? God comes. Right? God, God comes and begins to minister. And God comes to Hagar. And look what it says here. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring or a well of water in the wilderness. Right? Um, what does God do to people who are tempted to take things into their own hands. What does God do to people who are tempted to stop trusting God, where they don't want to wait anymore? You know, um, they're tired of waiting. Um, they don't want to be scared anymore. Uh, they don't want to be faithful in very anxious times. You know? What, is, what does God do? Well, one thing you learn is God meets you in that place. You know, uh, if you look at Scripture, uh, any time, uh, a lot of the times where you see this well, God meets people by a well, it's actually to bless them. Right? So you see this kind of symbolism that God, you know, uh, sovereignly, graciously meets Hagar by the well, uh, to bring blessings upon her life. And um, how does God minister? How does God minister to Hagar in her fear? How does God minister to us in our fear? Right? Uh, let, me share, let me share a couple things. First is this. In our fear, okay, uh, and, you know, um, 
Some of us are aware that we're afraid. Others, we don't even know, right? Uh, we know we're afraid by the decisions we make. But um, how does God minister, right? Well, uh, the first thing God does is this. He, he comes to you and he says, consider your ways. That, that's what he says. So, you know, in verse 8, he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? Right? You know, uh, this sounds a lot like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, right? Now, you know God, right? You know the character of God, right? He, he knows everything. Like, you know, like he's not asking this question for himself. Like he knows Hagar's on her way to Egypt. He knows that she's running away. You know, like, you know <laughs> I'd be really scared if God's like, Richard, what are you doing? And like he really didn't know, right? The reason why he asks questions to his people in Scripture is for them to consider, right? For them to think about it. But here's the catch, because you could ask, of course I've been thinking about it. Of course, I've been thinking about this for a really long time. Especially in anxious times and uh, fearful times, I think all the time. Because that's what we do, right? Don't you think all the time when times are fearful, right? When you're anxious, aren't you thinking all the time? But you know the difference is? I bet Hagar was thinking all the time. I bet she was obsessed with her thoughts. I bet Sarai was obsessed with the thought of her barrenness. I bet Abram was obsessed with the thought that he's not going to have a child. Hagar was obsessed with the thought that, you know, uh, if I stay longer in Sarai's camp, she's going to kill me and she's going to kill my baby. I bet that's all they could think about. Why? Because in anxious times, all you do is think about the problems of your life. But God goes to Hagar and he says, I want you to think. But the only difference was this. He says, think with me. Think with me. I know you've been thinking, but apart from me, nothing's going to happen but bitter fruit. But if you think with me, with me, that's how God begins to minister to our fears, right? So let me ask you, have you considered your circumstance with God? Have you considered your situation, your trial, your hardship in the presence of the Lord? Right? I bet the thoughts you're going to get, I bet the perspective that you're going to see things through with, I bet the trajectory and the decisions that you're going to make would be completely different because you made that simple choice to think with God. Right? Now, the second thing he says is this. He says, his ways are not our ways. So his ways are not our ways. God's ways are not our ways. So, you know, uh, Hagar says, you know, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress Sarai. Right? And it makes sense, doesn't it? Sarai's mistreating her. Uh, this word mistreat is actually a very harsh word in the Hebrew. Uh, it, 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 it could even mean an endangering of life. Right? So, you know, like it's not just verbal abuse, but I think Sarai was just going nuts. Right? All that stress of barrenness poured out upon Hagar. So Hagar makes a very human-centered decision. I need to run. I need to get out of here. I need to leave. So she runs away. But then look what the angel of the Lord says, right? Look, look at what God says. Verse 9, the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. Isn't that crazy? Right? Like, that's nuts. What do we learn here? Simple. God's ways are not our ways. 
You think you know the mind of God, you don't know the mind of God until God speaks to you. Right? Last thing Hagar was thinking, but God says this, if you trust me, if you obey me, if you surrender yourself to me, I will bless you. Look at verse 10. It says, moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to count. God said, you surrender yourself to me and do things that you've never considered in life, I will bless you like you've never been blessed before. You, you know, this is Abraham's promise, right? Right? Um, you know, when uh, ancient Near East people read about Abraham, they said, man, this guy is probably the most blessed man in the world because he was literally a Joe Schmo, no one knew him, and God said, I'm going to create a nation out of you. God gave the same promise to Hagar. God said to Hagar, I'm going to create a nation out of you. One of the greatest blessings that an ancient Near East person could ever receive. But to claim that blessing, to receive that blessing, she had to do something that was completely outside the trajectory of her thoughts. Right? Let me ask you today, when was the last time you've ex experienced God? Right? When was the last time you experienced God? Right? And I don't mean like, oh, like I, my heart was a little warm during praise. Like, you know. Like, when was the last time you really experienced God? Like, literally, God took you to another level of faith. Right? When was the last time? Right? Why is it that we as the people of God don't experience God? Right? So, we go, we go sometimes years without experiencing God, right? So, you know, we go years without experiencing God. So, you know, after a while, we think Christianity is nothing but coming to church on Sunday, maybe doing our quiet time a couple times a week, serving, and we think that's, that, that's the glory of Christianity, right? I just got to get myself to church, right? No, no. No, that, that's not what the faith is about. Christianity is about you experiencing God, right? Christianity is about you having a real, personal, practical, intimate relationship with God, right? But, but for some of us sitting here, we can't even remember the last time that's ever happened in our lives. Why is that? Because we don't even ask that question. We just lower the level of our satisfaction and expectation. Oh, you know what? God's not going to meet us here. Okay, maybe I'll just meet him here. Right? But do you know why? Right? And there's many reasons why. Okay, I'm just going to give you one today. Do you know why we don't experience God? Because here's the thing. Generally in Christian life, okay? Genuinely in Christian life, I want to say maybe 80, 90% of the time, you generally agree with God. Okay? That's why you're a Christian, right? I'm not saying that if you don't experience God, you're not a Christian. Even if you don't experience God, you're still a Christian if you believe that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead and he died for your sins. Okay? But if you're satisfied just with that, oh, man, that's sad because that's not part of the abundant life. Right? Yeah, you go to heaven, but you never get to walk in such intimacy with the Lord. So why is it that we don't experience God? Well, it comes down to this. If you're a Christian, 80 to, 80 to 90% of life, you generally agree with God. You guys are like walking in lockstep. You, when God says something, you're like, oh, Lord, I completely agree. Do not murder. Yes, Lord, right? You know, come to church on Sundays. Yes, Lord. Read the Bible. Yes, Lord, right? But it's that 10%. It's that 20% where you're walking with God, walking with God, and all of a sudden, God says something that you do not agree with. God says something that scares the bejesus out of you. 
God says something that's completely outside your worldview and the experiences that you have gone through in life. And when that happens and God says, hey, let's go this way, you decide to go this way. Therefore, never taking the path of experiencing God the way he wants you to. Therefore, for a long time, we are a people who only know God by knowledge rather than know God through experience, right? You know how you experience God? There's going to be times in your life where God calls you to surrender, to submit, to obey. There's going to come a time where the two roads will diverge, a road of knowledge and a road of experience. And every time we come to that crossroads, right, we choose our experience, we choose our past, we choose our knowledge, we choose what we think is right in our own eyes, and we don't trust God with all of our hearts. And we don't lean not on our own understanding. Therefore, we always miss the path that leads us to a deeper experience with God, right? Hagar was at that crossroads. Hagar was on her way to Egypt, and God said, Hagar, turn around and go back to the scene of your greatest fear. Hagar, turn around and go back to the place where you've been running from. And Hagar actually trusted God beyond her knowledge, beyond her understanding. And then she went back. And in that place, God fulfilled all the promises that he wanted to give her. And guess what? Hagar names God. You know, in Scripture, um, God comes and he names himself, right? So there's times in Scripture where God comes and he says, I am, you know, I am Jehovah, you know, I am Jehovah Jireh. Like, in times, in, sometimes in Scripture, God comes, this is who I am. But there's few times where the person names God, right? Where they look at God and they go, God, you are this. You know why they do that? Do you know why a person in Scripture names God? It, it doesn't mean because they're greater than God. It means they experienced Him. It means they, like, 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 you know, like when Hagar said, you know, then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, you are a God who sees. For she said, have I even remained alive here after seeing Him? Therefore, the well was called Beer Laha Roy, which means you are a God who sees me. So um, Hagar, right, looks at God and goes, you are a God who sees. Now, uh, she always knew that. She grew up in the household. You know, she, she understood, you know, Abraham probably taught his entire household the ways of God, right? So, you know, Abraham probably was like, yeah, God is all-knowing. He sees everything, right? She heard it, right? She heard it. She didn't experience it until this moment, Right? Some of you guys, you guys are like, God is faithful, God is good, right? You know, you sing goodness of God a lot, right? I want you to get to a point where you can look at God and you can actually name him. God, you are, you, you provide. God, you are so good. God, you are so loving. God, you are so faithful. God, you are the one who sees me. God, you are my defender. You're my shield. You're my glory. God, you are the lifter of my head. You know who names God the most in Scripture? <laughs> King David. He's naming God all the time. Why? Because he experienced what he knew. So, you know, brothers and sisters, let's stop the game. Let's stop playing this game where, you know, you come to church and you sing a couple songs and, you know, you listen to a talk and then you leave and then you live your life and then you come back and we just do this till we die. 
Like, life is more than that. Let's, let's fully embrace everything God wants to give us. Can I get an amen on that? Yeah. Right? That's what abundant life is. Right? And, and, and to do that is to take advantage of fearful times. It's to take advantage of anxious times. That in fearful times, we go deeper with the Lord. So that as we come out with the Lord, we can actually name the Lord. And my hope and prayer for you for these next six weeks is, after the end of these six weeks, you can actually look at God and you can say, God, you are so faithful. You are so good. God, you know me. God, you see me. God, you are the provider. That you can take one name of God and experience that. And you can look to God and say, this is who you are. And I'm so thankful. And every year, my hope is every year that you can name God for one of his names at least one time. Okay? So, you know, as the praise team comes up, um, I want to encourage you, are you, are you in a fearful moment? Um, are you tempted to make a human-centered decision? Um, are you in a season of waiting? You know, are you at that place where the 80% that you agree with God is about to run out? <laughs> and and you, see the, you see the fork in the road? Um, what is the Lord saying to you today? How is he speaking into your life? You know, um, if you're new to our church, uh, we actually have an extended prayer time. I mean, not like long, but, you know, we want to give God's people an opportunity to respond and worship and pray. And uh, please take advantage of it, you know? So, you know, uh, let the Lord speak to your thoughts. Uh, talk to God. Verbalize what is in your heart. Or if you're not there yet, just sing. Just sing. My encouragement is at least do one of the three. Let the Lord speak to your thoughts. Verbalize to the Lord what is in your heart because that's vulnerability, right? And God cares for you. And that's where intimacy will happen. Or if you're just like, I don't know what to say. I feel like I'm not hearing anything. Just sing. Sing to the Lord. But um, don't let times like this pass by. Right? He, God created a moment to meet you. So come before God and meet Him. Okay? And draw near to Him. May you have an encounter with the Lord today. Let's pray. Father, uh, we come before you. And um, we want to meet you today. So Holy Spirit, come and minister to each and every one of us. Take our fears away. Show us that you are a God who sees us, that you care for us. God, lead us into a deeper experience with you. God, lead us into a deeper relationship with you. God, show us the bitter fruits of doing things our own way. God, draw near to us and comfort our hearts and give us the faith in these fearful times. Thank you, Lord. Receive all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.